Hello and good morning everyone. Uh, seminar. Hello, sorry to webinar people, there was a glitch with the sound, it is on now. Uh, I was just saying hello to everyone and uh, welcome to the webinar on drug checking. My name's Jeff, I'm the presenter today and I just acknowledge the traditional owners of where we're meeting and learning today. Okay, let's get going. So today's presentation, we're going to look at a number of things. I want to give you an overview of what is drug checking exactly, uh, <clears throat> why it has been, I guess, prioritised or is a topic of kind of a bit of agitation at the moment, and what substances are of most concern and why. I'm going to talk some generally about principles of harm reduction, and then I'm going to explore some of the existing kind of methods, technologies and models that are either in place or available um, around the world. And looking at a spectrum from like home testing, forensic, hospital, community testing to on-site kind of mobile testing methods. And then at the end, a bit of a discussion around some of the benefits, some of the risks and other considerations uh, to consider when, you know, investigating or implementing a, a drug checking kind of model or regime. Uh, before I go any further, I'd like to just frame this whole conversation around principles of, of good harm reduction. Uh, drug checking is a harm reduction intervention and it's important to keep in our mind what underpins any good harm reduction kind of process to think about as we consider the, the following presentation. So for harm reduction to be good it has to have five key things in our opinion, my opinion. Uh, first of all it needs to be the right message, it needs to be accurate and technically correct, you know, it needs to be correct, it needs to be the right message. It needs to be delivered to the right person. You don't deliver harm reduction to people who are not currently using or intending to use. Uh, you would not go and do harm reduction around a particular, say, illicit substance in a school environment, in a broad kind of classroom area. Uh, similarly, you would not do, say, an injecting harm reduction advice to someone who smokes methamphetamine or, or ice. You know, it's specific to the person who is going to use a particular substance in a particular way, and you need to assess that and target your approach, uh, your um, response appropriately. So that kind of leads to the next thing. It needs to happen at the right time and the right place. There are certain opportunities which lend itself to the harm reduction chat or advice, and there are certain times when it's not appropriate. Uh, for example, often in crisis times, it's not appropriate to do the harm reduction chat. It's more around when people are just about to use or intending to use, and there are particular moments. Needle and syringe programs are ideal kind of harm reduction sites because of that. Uh, it, the message needs to be delivered in a way that is acceptable to the person. So this previous slide here is not a good example of potentially how to do a good harm reduction kind of message. Uh, lecturing or, um, you know, the just say no finger waving kind of approach is rarely shown to be effective in these sorts of instances. And lastly, it needs to find a good balance between the aspirational and the realistic. So what I mean by that is that we aspire that all substance users are going to avoid harms or any risks. That's what we aspire to, but we need to acknowledge the reality that uh, despite our best efforts and intentions that people will continue to use and will choose to use in ways which are less safe than others. And we need to find that balance of inspiring people to use as safely as possible versus realising the situations and circumstances where actual drug use happens. Particularly when I think about parties, you think about raves, you think about dance, um, music festivals and events. Uh, these sorts of environments, you need to be realistic about what the behaviours are and target your message accordingly. So they're the kind of broad kind of principles underpinning what I believe to be good harm reduction. So with that in mind, let's look at what drug checking is in more detail. So it's otherwise known or previously known as pill testing or adulterant screening, but drug checking is the more kind of current terminology. It's a harm reduction service that gives a consumer the opportunity to know what is in their product prior to taking it. And that's it in its most simple form. Uh, the primary focus uh, is actually not about the substance. For us, the primary focus is on engagement with what is traditionally a hard-to-reach target group uh, who are generally <coughs> young substance users. So if we think about the dance party or the, the music festival scene, a lot of those young people do not experience acute harms, they're not engaged in treatment services. Uh, and we really, apart from like first aid tents or incidents that might happen, they don't come in contact with us, the health worker, and therefore are hard to get good safety harm reduction messages to. So the primary kind of focus of drug checking is trying to get messages to this group of users who are potentially at very high risk of adverse events and overdose. The secondary focus then is actually on the substance and for what we're trying to identify is unknown or potentially dangerous adulterants. 
uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But we're also trying to know about high dose of intended substances. So people generally, you know, trying to, in most cases, identify or use MDMA. It's very high dose MDMA. So it's not about an adulterant. It's about a high purity of the intended substance. Or alternatively, somebody thinks they have a particular drug and it's actually telling them what is in fact what they, what they are using, which may in fact be a quite a different substance altogether. Um, yeah. uh, so our current kind of engagement with ecstasy users in Queensland is very limited uh, in terms of that kind of recreational pattern of use. Uh, we have at music events and festivals law enforcement and sniffer dogs, and we have some basic first aid and chill out type spaces. For example, the Red Cross Save and Mate program often does kind of spaces in, in festivals. That's Apart from what festivals might organise themselves in terms of a chill-out space, there are only current kind of funded kind of programs or engagement with uh, MDMA or ecstasy users in that festival kind of context. So there's a space for us, for this to operate. Is it new? It's definitely not new. Uh, the origins lie in Europe in the dance music or rave scene from the 80s and 90s when the emergence of counterfeit and contaminated pills first kind of appeared and Holland established a, a pill testing system in 1993, so almost 25 years ago, which is still in a new form, you know, in operation today. What has changed, however, is that illicit drug markets have, have evolved and changed, particularly over the last past decade. And we know that with the emergence of all these novel psychoactive substances uh, and patterns of consumption have changed in tandem with that, particularly with um, purchasing substances online and off the dark net, and also the ways people can communicate about their substance using experiences online and using all various different sorts of apps. The level of information going around and misinformation is a lot higher than probably it used to to be, it used to be. Furthermore, the testing technologies have evolved over the last 20 years. So that's what's new. The recent focus, if we look at the National Drug Strategy Household Survey from 2013, about 2.6% of Australians have used ecstasy in the past 12 months, which equates to about 400,000 young people between 14 and 30. Uh, lifetime use is about 11.5%, and the highest group, which is 20 to 29-year-olds, sits at about 22%, and for the currently the 30 to 39-year-old age group is 23%, which is probably a product of the fact that 90s, the 90s was a period of exceptionally high substance use across uh, all of Australia, and that cohort is now moving through uh, the, the, the survey results now. The recent focus has also been because we've had a particularly kind of nasty spate of deaths over the past 12 to 18 months, and seven young people have died, six of them at music festivals. Some have been more high profile than others, but you can see those names there, Georgina, Tolga, Jared, Stefan, Nigel, Annika, Sue and Sylvia have all uh, passed away following taking an unknown or known substance at music festivals and events over the past 12 to 18 months. And New South Wales recently reported a doubling of their ED hospital presentations over the past six years, uh, whilst arrests for possessions have also quadrupled. And this has caused a whole bunch of media attention, including a recent Four Corners show uh, on the topic, uh, 60 Minutes and other TV and print kind of articles have been in circulation recently. So which substances are, are of most concern? Uh, MDMA itself. Uh, so recent reports of very high dose MDMA in both tablet and crystal powder forms. Uh, if you have a look at that red pill on the left, the, the Burger King pill, uh, that was detected in Europe with um, an astonishing 300 milligrams of MDMA inside it. And if you think of a standard dose of a regular pill, it's anywhere from like 60 milligrams to maybe 120 is a fairly kind of strong dose. If we're looking at 300 milligrams, that's a double tripling of a kind of purity in one pill. Um, it's actually suspected that a number of the deaths are not from the adulterants, but actually just high dose MDMA consumed by these young people at festivals. Uh, and in 2015, all of these pills here are, are a premium pill that was uh, manufactured, I believe, in Netherlands and sent across Europe and the rest of the world, which had a very high dose MDMA following a new uh, synthesis method that was invented around using PMK glycodate. So we're talking about 200 milligram type pills uh, in circulation. Um, and they have reached Australia as well, we believe. Uh, I guess the big one that most people think about when they think about uh, adulterant screening is PMA and PMMA, or paramethoxy or methyl methamphetamine. Uh, look, this is a drug which is synthesized using phenyl or aniseed oil as opposed to saffron, which is the, uh, the 
precursor to making MDMA. Uh, aniseed or phenyl is legal and a lot of manufacturers will use that to test the synthesis of a new batch and produce PMA to work out if the synthesis is correct before using safol. Uh, most well, you'd think that a lot of the time those pills are discarded, but in sometimes they hit the markets, and that's when PMA and PMMA hit the streets. Uh, at low doses, it's similar effects to MDMA. Uh, at a higher, slightly higher doses, it affects the heart rate, blood pressure, and body temperature. And at higher doses, still, it can lead to vomiting, muscle spasms, convulsions, difficulty breathing, coma, and death. Uh, it's the death pill. You know, it's it's that's what it's rec it's um kind of fame and notoriety is about. And why it is so dangerous is it, unlike MDMA, it takes a particularly long time to come on. So it can take one to two hours. So what a user may do is take it, think it is a weak pill, and then take a second one, and all of a sudden there's a high dose response curve, and they've overdosed, overheat, and come into big troubles there. It's particularly risky in combination with uh, MDMA because it's an MAOI, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which means that it will uh, stop the breakdown of serotonin, which will cause that serotonin syndrome more likely to occur. So pills that have both PMMA or PMA and MDMA are particularly uh, dangerous to the user. Uh, and these are some famous kind of pills in circulation. Last year, the the Pink Superman and the Mitsubishis of uh, yesteryear were notorious as being uh, contained as MPMA. Uh, Queensland is not immune to this. In 2012, there was an interesting case study of a bunch of blue Louis Vuitton pills that caused a bunch of deaths here in Queensland. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was the Sunday Mail that blew this story after they pieced together uh, a number of deaths at hospitals and reports by users on a online pill report site. And basically, they first established that this Louis Vuitton pill was potentially dangerous and published it, and it was tested later and confirmed to have PMMA in it. So I think there were approximately three or four deaths, uh, we're not quite sure, to this pill in 2012 and a whole bunch of hospitalizations. So uh, that kind of shows, uh, that's an informal early warning system, I guess, is when the media pick it up. Uh, but I guess a drug checking uh, system would be designed to pick this up earlier before perhaps the Sunday Mail would. This is the other drug that's causing concern for many practitioners at the moment is the N-Bone series. Uh, and there's a number of different types, 25B, 25C, 25I. This is an extremely powerful kind of hallucinogen, which is an analog of an analog. It's a derivative of the phenethylamine 2CI, um, which was invented in the 90s. And in 2003, it was then again synthesized into the N-Bone series. Um, it's powerful in the microgram range. So we're looking at 0.05 of a milligram for it to have a psychoactive effect. Uh, however, it's uh, orally active uh, as opposed to uh, ingestion through the stomach. You will get an effect that way, but it's more active through the nasal kind of passages. So most early users were um, insufflating it or you know mixing to nasal spray and, and snorting it that way. Because of its uh, high purity or high um, toxicity, um, lots of overdoses have happened. And there was a mass overdose at Kelvin Grove here in Brisbane at a party where someone had made up a batch of nasal spray and everyone had sprayed it. And there was about eight or nine kind of hospitalizations that night. Uh, but more recently, it's also appeared in liquid and sorry, as blotter form and being marketed as LSD because of its hallucinogenic effect and also in powder press tablets. Uh, so because it is a hallucinogen, it does have some similar effects to LSD, uh, but opposed to LSD, which has no taste, uh, n bones has a very bitter taste, uh, and that would often be a sign to someone swallowing a LSD tab thinking it was LSD that it may not be that. Uh, and this drug itself has caused lots of different problems, as I've mentioned. Uh, particularly online reports, you hear about people swallowing it and having um, a, you know, a, a night out or a bizarre night out, and then some friends crushing and snorting a pill at the end of the night and ending up in hospital because of the fact that it is nasally active and, and, and orally active, etc. Uh, and a lot of the people find it a very intense experience, and that's why a number of deaths have, have eventuated from car accidents, drowning, repeated head trauma from bashing into street posts in one particular story, uh, because people find it too intense and want it to end and, and, um, and you know, come to unfortunate endings like that. Also reported to have very tactile sensations, so incredibly itchy skin. So reports that um, nightclubs of people taking off their clothes and scratching themselves against 
the floor because their skin is so uncomfortably itchy, which is an interesting kind of side effect. Uh, and the most notorious or significant story that hit the media was around Henry Kwan, which I think was around 2013, where a young fellow took a, an N-bone tab and jumped off his balcony uh, and to his death um, one evening. So that's kind of when it started to really hit the scope of the general kind of public. But of course, there's other substances that users are keen to know are in their drugs or not. GHB would be a key one, opiates. Uh, we're hearing a bit about APVP or FLACA at the moment. It's the latest kind of novel psychoactive uh, kind of stimulant. Uh, and also MDPV and methadrone, which have been around now for quite some years. Uh, people want to know if they're taking ketamine, because that can be a quite an uncomfortable experience if you're not expecting it. Uh, or whether their pill is containing methamphetamine or Ritalin or piperazines, which has some similar effects to MDMA but leaves you with a nasty headache and most people don't like doing it twice. Uh, and people who use cocaine want to know it's got its purity and whether it's being cut with like levamisole or phenacetin, levamisole being a worming agent and phenacetin being an analgesic. Uh, and like I said, with LSD and psilocybin as well in terms of hallucinogens. So users want to know what they're taking essentially. One final point to make is that even though we might determine what's in a particular pill or powder, there's no guarantee that that means it'll determine what its effects are on an individual. On an individual. And Zinberg in the mid-80s developed this model of drug set and setting, which says that there are particular effects associated with a drug, but then there are individual characteristics around someone's personal constitution which affects how that drug is, uh, is experienced. And then the environment in which that drug is taken also combines to uh, I guess, determine the overall experience of a substance-taking occasion. Uh, and so that's why even if you were to identify the components of a pill, that doesn't necessarily give you an extremely accurate indication of the level of harm it has. It might point to increased harms or less harms potentially, but doesn't necessarily um, say that definitively because of the way our individual bodies react to substances and the environment which it is consumed in. So that's just a little framework to keep in your mind. Okay, so that's why people are advocating for drug checking or pill testing. If we want to look at the existing kind of methods, technologies and models available, um, there are programs currently operating around the world in the United Kingdom, Netherlands, Switzerland, Austria, Belgium, Germany, Spain, France and parts of the US. And they range from formalised and government endorsed programs, research projects run through hospitals and universities, all the way to peer-run um, programs which may or may not be endorsed by governments. So uh, that's the scope of the different types of methodologies around. Uh, and this diagram, this spectrum, kind of gives you an indication of where they sit in relation to each other. Down the left-hand side of the diagram is, I guess, the level of intervention or how complex it is. Uh, and to the right suggests the more resource intensive it would be. And I'll go through each of these in a bit more detail. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about now is uh, home kits, forensic testing, emergency department testing, community health testing, and on-site or mobile testing. Okay, so home kits. This has been kind of the backbone of uh, pill testing or drug checking now for many decades. Uh, it's currently occurring throughout Australia and all around the world with kits purchased generally over online or in commercial outlets. And basically it's a reagent or colour metric testing kind of system which you would put a small amount of scraping and mix it with this uh, chemical which is generally a sulfuric acid plus a some other compound and based on the colour uh, would determine what the contents are. So the marquee reagent test, uh, for example, if you mix it with your powder or scraping will come up with a number of different colours and you can see by the little um, key on the bottom right hand side would determine what substance that is. I won't go through it in all detail, but you can have a look at that in your notes. Uh, the Mechie reagent test uh, is a similar test. Uh, and this one also kind of detects codeine, morphine and hydrocone, whereas um, the Marquis test does not. And the mandolin reagent test now this one's probably a bit more interesting because unlike the other ones, it can do a positive ID for PMA or PMMA. So this one is of particular interest for people who suspect they may have a, a tainted pill. And you can see uh, PMA or PMA will come up with that kind of orangey brown colour. But then if you look compare that to heroin or ketamine, you can see the subtle variations in the colour make it extremely kind of difficult to ascertain with any real kind of certainty uh, what that substance may or may not be. 
so this is a picture that I've taken off pillreports.net. Uh, this is a green uh, grenade pill that was uh, found in Victoria a number of months ago, and that's the mandolin test result there. And you can tell by that blacky blue kind of colour that that contains MDMA or an MD kind of derivative, MDA, MDEA, etc. Um, so yeah. And here's another pill that was tested recently, and I'll show you all the different kind of results for that. Uh, the Simons test on the end, that is if you first identify that the pill is containing an MD something, MDMA, MDA. Uh, this will determine whether or not it's uh, MDMA or MDA, so or methamphetamine or amphetamine, or methadone or methylene. It'll determine whether it's got the meth component of it. So that's what that particular test does. But generally users would not just rely on one test, they would use a couple of different tests to try and determine the contents of their pill uh, if, if they are using this system. Uh, and the other one is Ehrlich's reagent test. So this uh, test positive for LSD and other kind of hallucinogens on that list, psilocybin and DMT, it will not come up with any colour for uh, the NBOME series. So this is the test that most uh, LSD users are using to determine whether or not their blotter actually contains uh, NBOME or LSD. Uh, so these are all available and EasyTest is the largest kind of online stockist in Australia and you can go onto that website and look at all their product range and it has descriptions and videos on how to use them and they can be purchased and posted to you. Uh, so if you're interested in knowing more about this testing kit system, that's it. Uh, and a lot of these tests are used and are form the backbone of the reporting system used by pillreports.net. Uh, this is a system that's been running for many years or decades now where essentially people will uh, you know, report on a pill that they have come into possession of. They will generally, or they are asked to by moderators to do a reagent testing and to post it results and to describe the pill, its colour, shape, size, uh, where they got it from and then following their use what they suspect the contents to be. Uh, reports that come up red, highlighted in red, either determine it has a, a known adulterant to it, which might be PMA or PMA, or it's unknown what it is. So it's a bit of a warning sign for users. And so users can go on, check their pill against the list there and determine quite rudimentally, I guess, whether or not that pill may or may not have some kind of harms with it. Uh, and if you want to go, I won't read this out, but this is an example of a re user report based on a pill which is suspected to contain PMA, and on the right-hand side is the moderator response. So there is a, it's a discussion board where people can go and have a look at um, what, you know, a real-life user might have. Now, if you're working with an, an ecstasy user, I would really encourage you to go on pill reports with them and have a look at it. And the reason being for that is that, you know, People are so used to getting the just say no message or that pills are dangerous and you don't know what you're going to get. And often some users may tune out of that message because um, you know it's part of the just say no campaign which they're a little bit inured against or um, sceptical of. However, what this kind of site does is actually show posts from users actually talking about what they have discovered and, and not. So it actually does help to bro broaden their kind of uh, understanding of the various types of risks. It's not a health or a campaign going drugs are bad, it's users saying these ones are you know, risky and these ones perhaps may not be as risky. So it does help to open up that conversation around different types of risks and harms. So uh, www.pillreports.net is where you can go to do that. Uh, do we have time? I'll quickly show you this video just because it shows um, one of the pitfalls of the of the reagent or colorimetric testing scheme, um, what it is, and I will turn off my volume this so people uh, online won't hear me, but I'll just show you a quick clip of, or will I? Maybe I'll, actually I'll wait, it goes for six minutes, I'll wait at the end and see if we've got time, I'd hate to leave myself short, but basically what this video shows is uh, a, a green pill that was found in, this is in London, these guys, and they tested it using the Marquee, the Mendelin, and the Meki test, and it all came positive for MDMA. It came up with that dark blue, purple, black colour colour. 
uh, and then they did a GCMS testing of it, and it determined that it contained both MDMA and PMA and PMMA. So what that kind of shows is that while these tests are useful in determining what is in the substance, it doesn't necessarily then tell you what isn't in the substance as well. So combo pills uh, often do fail the reagent test because of uh, you know the, the dark colouring of MDMA will overpower the colours of the other drugs that you're potentially looking for. Uh, look, there's a link is there if you want to go and watch it and see kind of how that is. So that's something to keep in mind as a probably the biggest kind of pitfall or drawback of the home reagent testing kind of system. So a quick recap, the positives of a home test kit are that they're cheap, they're fast, you know, results are generally within 30 seconds to a um, couple of minutes. They're very, they're fairly easy to use because it's just add a scraping to a vial and shake it around or to a dropper. They're very portable, they're easily available and their uh, sophistication is improving all the time. The negatives or cons about home testing kit is that there's a high risk of user error with them. Uh, in, but also from firstly determining what the colour is and whether it kind of matches up. Uh, they have limited shelf life, they need to be stored in the fridge. If they're left out of the fridge, they'll weaken their effectiveness. Uh, as I mentioned, it's difficult to identify adulterants in combo pills. Uh, you are unable to determine the strength or purity of your sample, so all you will determine is whether a drug is there or not. Uh, the pill dyes itself can affect the outcomes. Uh, but I mentioned before, it hurting your eyes or skin if you were to spill it. And you can't really use them out in public because of how technical they are. So they're not very easy to use at a party or in a, or in a kind of dance floor or dance kind of club, etc. However, they are the best offering currently available for large-scale testing by the public. OK, I'll move along. So that's the home reagent colorimetric testing. The next uh, system is the forensic testing. So this is where substances seized are delivered for forensic testing and results are returned uh, to the police in Queensland. Uh, and so they would use a fancy machine called a gas chromatography mass spectrometer or, or grass or mass spectrometry. That's what the machine, or a machine, kind of looks like. It looks very impressive. It separates uh, the substance into its component chemicals or constituents uh, by using pulses of pure chemicals and gases and then it gets sent to the mass spectrometer to identify and quantify how much of each of those chemicals exist. So it gives you a reliable, detailed, accurate breakdown of not only what substances are in there but the percentage, the, rate, the proportion of them as well, qualitative and quantitative kind of results. Chromatography mass spectrometer. Uh, it uses liquid instead of gas to achieve the same result and isolate those different chemical compounds. Uh, again, this is a video you can go watch at home which shows the demonstration of how the machine is used. So if you're interested to see a bit more of the technical side of it, please go to this link and watch it. Uh, and it will determine, show you the printout that you get from it. Uh, I had a quick search on eBay last night, and you can buy them online. Here's one for four and a half thousand dollars from the US. Postage might be a bit hard, but there are 15 people watching it, so you better be quick if you want one. Um, so yeah, like, but they are expensive kind of machines, and they're, but they are the gold standard, I guess, in terms of determining results. So that's the positives of it. They're accurate. They give you quantitative analysis, and they're fairly fast. They take about 20 to 40 minutes to. Uh, to test a substance and get, a, and get the breakdown. Uh, the negatives of them are that they are expensive, they are big machines to lug around, so they're not very mobile, they either need to be in a fixed lab environment or you uh, set them up in the back of a van, and the results aren't instantaneous. So unlike the home reagent test, there is that delay which may or may not work for some users, a bit too eager to consume their substances. But the verdict for them is that they're essential if we want to do accurate and reliable results with with quantification. Uh, so forensic testing in Queensland, so currently we any substance seized by QPS is sent to analysis at our Queensland Health Forensic Scientific Services out at Cooper's Plains. Uh, the results may take depend weeks or months depending on the backlog of samples to test. Uh, those results are published in a police kind of bulletin called the Buzz, uh, which is an internal report for them and selected agencies, but that's not made available to the public or to health practitioners like ourselves. So currently there's no real regular mechanism for public notification of high-risk drugs. Uh, occasionally the police will issue media warnings, uh, but it's uh, fairly hit and miss or inconsistent. 
depending on what is actually out on the market. Uh, in fact, the only state in Australia which currently has regularly allows the public access to kind of the results of seizure data happens in Victoria. So that's the state of play around the, the forensic testing. Uh, and the emergency department, so sorry, the next model which is uses also a GCMS, LCMS kind of system is emergency department testing. So this would be if someone f um, experiences some misadventure and ends up in hospital and maybe there is some pills in his or her pocket which are found or fall out or via an amnesty bin system where they are encouraged or invited to submit a sample of pills into a bin, then that could the same system but it doesn't use uh, a, a, the police as the entry point, it's using the hospital as an entry point. Uh, this uh, doesn't really happen much in Australia. There is a model that Dr David Caldicott is doing at Calgary Private Hospital in Canberra uh, where he has done some tests of pills that have been presented through his emergency department there. Um, but that is another option that can be explored. I guess it, it's just another contact point for these substances getting to a, a, a testing lab or facility. Okay, uh, so, and look, this is for an example of what Dr. Caldicott discovered in Canberra, I think in 2013, were a bunch of pills that were presented from an unfortunate uh, visitor to the emergency department. They were blue Batman pills, they were tested and it was confirmed to contain 2,5-C end bones. So that's what caused a spate of actual deaths were uh, resulting from these particular pills down in Victoria in 2013. Okay, so the next model I'd like to quickly run through is a community health testing model. Uh, this is where there is a service set up in the community where it's a stationary service where people would come in and they would provide a sample and they would talk to a nice nurse or social worker or psychologist and provide a sample of their pill. There would be an intervention that happens right there around the particular substance and you know they would ask where did you know what, what do you intend to do with it, how much do you intend to use, when do you want to use it, what you think is in the pill and they would do a, an instant home, oh, sorry, a reagent test to get an initial response and then send it off for GCMS testing or LCMS testing with the results to be publicised at a later date. Uh, so the most famous or well-known model that uses this kind of um, community health stationary setting happens in the Netherlands and this is a picture from there and I'll show you a quick clip soon uh, and where you know basically they would match up a pill presented with a database and then do testing to determine what is in it. Uh, so I've got a quick video which I will show you on this one just to give you a bit of video and, and audio of this. Ingyard van der Heide is the same age as Gemma was when she died, but she lives in Holland where every major city here has a state-sanctioned pill testing centre. I brought one pill. You bought it as ecstasy? Yeah, I bought it as, okay. as ecstasy. Like about 70% of ecstasy users worldwide, Ingyard only takes the drug occasionally. And that's even more reason for her to want to find out exactly what she's taking. Do you know how much you need to take for your body weight? Uh, I know because I'm a woman I can get one to one and a half milligrams of MDMA for each kilogram I have. The pill that you've just tested, tell me about it. It's a very high uh, dose pill. For a girl uh, with her weight and length it's, it's too much so she needs to be aware of it. How does that change your behaviour, if at all? I will just take a quarter or half and then we will see. But no, I will never take one pill at a one moment. That's too much. It always is. Okay, so there you can see like an example of the stationary method where people would come in and, and present the pill. I might, I forgot to add, that's from a recent 60 Minutes documentary called Testing Times, which was aired I think late last year. Uh, it's available on the Channel 9 uh, website to go and watch if you'd like. It's about a 13 minute uh, cl a clip which talks about different pill testing and drug checking um, models around the world if you want to know a bit more about it. So, yep, so that's that kind. Of, that's that model, the stationary model. The other model, which is an operation around the world, is the on-site or mobile testing model. 
Uh, and so this is the outreach component of the stationary one, where you actually take the testing and the and the and the staff um, to the places where people are going to take their drugs right there, right then. Uh, so generally, this is used, um, or most popularly known, is in Austria, uh, where they would take a mobile van or the Check It program, it's called, and to uh, particular entertainment precincts and to festivals. And uh, this is where again users would submit a sample, and it would. Um, be tested and the results posted immediately to users. So I'll just show you this video uh, as well. Because they can have their drugs tested right next to the dance floor. I got ecstasy. Okay. All that is required for the test is a tiny scraping. The police stay away to encourage the young party goers to have their drugs checked, which is done in a mobile lab outside. Chemist Rainer Schmidt and drugs counsellor Carl Kotschaper run this program in Vienna, paid for by the city's health department. We see drug taking as a fact, so we want to promote safer use, but the, the, the decision is always on their side. The test takes about 30 minutes, 30 minutes that could save a life by informing the user exactly what they're about to take. So a program like this helps people decide whether to take them or not to take them? Okay. Yeah, I think it decides a lot more because when somebody has knowledge about stuff, then he can decide it for his own what to do. The results are posted on a notice board. White means your pill contains what you thought it did. Yellow means there are other drugs in it. Red means it's unknown or highly dangerous. Do you believe you're saving lives? Yes, I do. So there you can see the mobile on-site testing. So that's using a GCMS machine in a van parked outside the clubs and with instant kind of reporting back to the users um, in the venues where the drugs are being consumed. So that's probably, yeah, the most probably resource intensive in terms of staffing and technology, but the most instant and accurate in terms of the amount of information that can be gleaned. So yeah, so I'd like to end this uh, presentation with a bit of a discussion um, around, you know, generally around drug checking and what its impacts and kind of considerations need to be. Um, so Alison Ritter published a great article just a couple of months ago where she summarised a number of the potential benefits of a drug checking or pill testing kind of program and uh, she identified that based on research that it can change the black market. So essentially by eliminating adulterant or um, contaminated pills, it forces manufacturers to, uh, you know, to improve or to not contaminate further pills because it, therefore those pills aren't going to be bought or sought after anymore once people realise uh, that they're potentially dangerous. It also improves the consistency between what people think they're going to take and what is actually contained within the pill or powder itself. Uh, research from Austria has also shown that it does actually change behaviour. So people who had their drugs tested, 50% uh, of those people who had their drugs tested said that it would affect their consumption choices, with two said saying that, saying that they uh, wouldn't consume the drug and would warn friends if they determined that there was a negative result. So people uh, will generally um, change their behaviour based on the results of the testing. Uh, and most importantly, I guess, for us from a health perspective, it provides that important contact point for the provision of information, brief interventions and harm reduction for a particularly hard to reach target group. And there are opportunities for treatment and referral from there uh, as well. Uh, the other benefit is just data and intelligence gathering for both health and law enforcement agencies uh, for two reasons. We can do long-term trends in illicit drug markets and patterns of consumption and uh, early warning systems for getting information out to current users when you know, particularly risky batches of substances are identified. Uh, essentially, it's matching up a, a cohort that we currently don't have a lot of information on. We have seizure data, so that's the drugs that are detected by police, uh, but we don't have all of the other drugs that are not detected by police. So it would be potentially a way to match up a different or new data set to confirm each other's kind of experiences. 
Uh, one of the potential risks uh, of this is that it may not be effective for all users. There is um, some evidence that it may be underutilized by some people who are going to consume their drug regardless, and some people may ignore the results and decide to consume a drug regardless of what the results say. Uh, and I guess this is probably no different to any ha other harm reduction type approach that we do. We know in an NSP we tell people how to inject safely. There's no actual evidence that that will, I mean there is some evidence that it will um, improve you know, or reduce risky behaviour but not for everyone. There's no guarantee that that will uh, have the desired behaviour effect in all individuals. Uh, and it also may give a false appearance of safety for some people uh, and this is a concern most commonly voiced I guess by people who are a bit unsure about it that it would send the message of some users that their pill or powder is safe uh, when this is not true uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. The other thing is that it's uh, difficult to prove its impact or its effectiveness or which harms you avoided. It's, you know, it's hard to just uh, prove with strong evidence of a death that's avoided or a harm that is avoided. We can measure harms and deaths really easily but it's hard to measure when it doesn't happen. Uh, particularly because if a batch of tainted or kind of contaminated pills etc got out to the market um, whilst we might say last time we discovered PMA there were five deaths, this time we don't, we don't know the size of that batch. We don't know if there was just a few hundred or a thousand of those pills pressed or whether there were 20,000. So it's really hard to know uh, with any great certainty the effects of a particular intervention based on um, deaths or adverse events in hospitals afterwards. Um, if you want to know more information, there's a link to the Alison Ridical article I just mentioned and Dr. David Caldicott also had an article in the conversation in December last year where they run through some of these potential benefits, risks um, of drug checking programs. And this leads me on to a bit of a discussion that if we are to investigate um, a drug checking or pill testing program, there are a number of practice principles which would underpin a good one. Uh, and mainly in number one it requires, it's essential that it's a strong cooperation and partnership between health and police. It won't work otherwise so that uh, has to underpin any kind of efforts in this area. Uh, it needs to be specifically targeted and promoted to the right user group. Like I mentioned before in the principles of harm reduction, uh, you are targeting people who have already decided to take drugs at festivals and nightclubs. You are not taking these vans around the schools. Uh, it is targeted towards you know, the existing users only. Uh, using a mix of technologies is important to improve data accuracy and consistency by validating multiple kind of lines of evidence. And any harm reduction intervention provided at a pill testing or drug checking site should not just focus on the substance but the way it is consumed or the route of administration and other related behaviours such as health, legal, sexual or social. So it is an opportunity to, to have a broader chat around the impact or harms of particular substances and the way that they are used. And I guess in, in response to that message around the concerns that it may give the impression that some drugs are safe, um, the central message must always remain that there is no safe level of substance use. And you know, no practitioner in the alcohol and drug field would ever not say that. Uh, if they do say that and you hear it, you need to run them out of the industry please because they do not belong here. It is not the right message that there is a safe level of substance use. What we can do is look at actively minimising and reducing the harms associated with substance use on a kind of targeted, um, tailored kind of approach. So if um, this uh, sort of program is to be implemented, these are the sort of considerations or requirements. Um, First of all, who would do it? Uh, would it be delivered by uh, the public health or hospital system? Would it happen as part of a hospital campus and um, delivered by government or would it be delivered by the non-government sector? Uh, where would it happen? Uh, would it be a stationary site like uh, the model in the Netherlands or would it be a portable or on-site kind of mobile model that would go around to festivals or both? Or could you look at a postal model which has been trialled in some areas, I believe in the US, but has a whole bunch of difficulties around kind of the Customs Act and the telecommun not telecommunications, the Postal Communications Federal Act, uh, which um, creates particularly difficulties for that model. 
Uh, the next question or consideration is the skills, competencies and qualifications of the providers, so the people doing it. You know, is it delivered by health practitioners and professionals and harm reduction experts such as nurses, doctors, social workers, psychologists, OTs, or is it a peer model? And what are the quality kind of controls you can do to make sure that any harm reduction advice is accurate and appropriate. Uh, the next question is what results are notified? Do you re publish the results of all testing or do you just release high risk results only? And if you do do that, what determines, what's the cutoff for a high risk? Uh, is it, I mean the PMA is an obvious one for a high risk, but do you have a line at where an MDMA pill is deemed to be particularly dangerous and what is that? Is that 140 milligram? Is that 180? Like, so that's decisions that would need to be made or do you just publish everything? Uh, who do you publish the results with and, and how? Do you publish it direct to the user and if you do that, is it a verbal interaction? Is it written to them or is it by SMS? So how do you communicate back to the supplier of the substance uh, or do you publish it online or both? Uh, some models around the world will do drug checking but will only ever publish dangerous results online and won't give any direct kind of information to the consumer. So, you know, there are different kind of approaches to that and, and the question then is does that reduce the efficacy or usefulness if the direct user isn't going to find any information about their own particular substance. There are obvious issues around preserving user confidentiality and managing access by police. Uh, to the site where it happens and also public access by sticky beaks wanting to have a look at where a pill testing site might be. Uh, and then importantly legal protections and arrangements for service providers. So how do drug checking providers avoid civil liability claims or possession and supply charges? Uh, and actually there's some interesting advancement technology around the handheld ion scanning which is potentially a way to you know, reduce some of that risk because you don't really need to get or possess a sample of the drug. You can just run a toothpick against the sample and submit it into the ion scan and there is no exchange of the, the substance between the user and the tester but that can give you a fairly good accurate results there. So there are some ways to look at that I guess difficult area around the legal status of possession and supply. Uh, and then uh, some procedures and controls for presenting the system is used by dealers and suppliers. So how do you stop gaming by users trying to promote their great pills or their great powders by using this system and certainly models overseas have got procedures in place which actively uh, deter or refuse to use obvious uh, dealers who are using the system uh, deliberately to promote their particular substance. Okay, so that's it. That's kind of the overview of drug checking. Um, it's a, a system which is not new. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's been, there's plenty of evidence around it from overseas, but there's limited trials here in, in Australia. Uh, and on that basis, I'd like to open up to the floor to questions. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. The question from the floor for people in webinar land is, how would you respond to parents that this sort of system may be condoning or tacit support for drug taking? Uh, and look, I think it is a valid concern and it is a valid kind of question that will be asked by not just parents but many parts of society. And my response would be is that, you know, we currently already do a whole bunch of harm reduction kind of systems that have evolved over the past 20 to 30 years in Australia, you know, including NSP, so provision of, you know, needle and syringe availability. Uh, we also have in Queensland quite progressive illicit drug diversion systems where if you get busted with up to 50 grams of cannabis or one gram of, of pills and powders or three tickets of LSD, you can be diverted out of the justice system. You know, the, the same question could be pointed towards those programs. How, do they not also condone or tacitly support substance use by weakening criminal kind of sanctions for it? It's just another harm reduction tool. It's not a panacea. This is not going to, you know, solve everything, but it potentially, you know, just gives us extra information and advice and it does provide us that really important contact point with a really hard to engage user group. Um, I mean, the other message that we are sending by not investigating it is that um, in order to maintain the drugs a dangerous harm, uh, we occasionally need to lose a few lives and have a few adverse events for that message to be, you know, to be maintained. 
and certainly I think the the art of it is in the delivery. Uh, I would be perfectly, I get, you know, it's perfectly valid to say that you would not be promoting this program anywhere outside of where it is going to be focusing on existing users. So you do not promote this at schools. You do not promote this to young people. You are only targeting this to people who are already using. It's not a high profile, shine and lights kind of pro, um, system. It's targeted and deliberate in its application. You know, harm reduction is not controversial. It's part of our national drug strategy now for over 25 years. This is just another tool in it. We did it with NSPs. Uh, health workers all the time are doing the harm reduction chat with clients, you know, and we have worked out how to do that in an appropriate way, which doesn't condone but also informs and educates to reduce harms. There's no difference between that and what a drug checking kind of system might do in itself. Just another contact point. Thanks. Good question. Uh, I'm not sure of that question. The question was, is there um, work or any moves to gain access to the buzz report by police? Uh, look, I'm not sure. I know some of that data is it's quite sensitive and there are legitimate concerns about that getting in the hands of the public, um, but no, I'm not aware of any current um, kind of information sharing protocols around it. But it's perhaps something that could be investigated. Okay, just quickly, I'm going to go to the webinar questions. Uh, there's a question uh, that there was no substance use on the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Who are the companies across the globe that are leading the utilisation of the data that the tests collect? I'm not sure if there's a coordination of the data results across different countries. I know in Europe through the uh, EMCDDA, the European Monitoring Centre for Drug and Drug Addiction, which is operated out of Lisbon in Portugal, uh, they certainly do collate data from a lot of the European kind of nations and report on that regularly. But in terms of intercontinental coordination, I'm not sure if there is. So I'm not sure... Maybe it is, and we don't. I don't know about it. Uh, I am not an expert. I forgot to maybe mention that at the beginning. I have just crashed, uh, study, crammed this particular topic for this presentation. But maybe my colleagues Cameron Francis or Dr. Caldecott might be able to give more information about that particular one. Will we become a dumping ground for dodgy pills if we're the only country not to do drug checking? That's an interesting kind of theory. Um, I'm not too sure how sophisticated our drug markets are, but uh, that is potentially a risk, I guess, if, you know, it is, but I guess that would require a widespread uh, implementation of drug checking for us to become a dumping ground. Uh, there are plenty of users out there, and the, currently the Australian approach to drug taking at festivals is you don't need to know what it is, you're just going to take it. You know, you rock up to a festival, you unless you're bringing your own, you ask around until you get it, you then take it. So I guess to some extent, no matter how much information we are, that behaviour is fairly well entrenched and ingrained amongst um, recreational substance users at festivals and events. Uh, any other questions? from the audience. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, there is one more? Yes, Sean. Yep. Uh, that's a good, so the question is, if drug checking were to be implemented at festivals, uh, how long away would that be? Uh, currently there are no plans that I'm aware of to implement a government endorsed uh, drug checking regime or scheme at festivals. I do believe that Alex, Dr. Alex Wodek and Dr. David Caldecott are investigating trialling their own system, uh, So, but I'm not sure of the extent of that at this stage. Um, there are, I mean, the, one of the biggest barriers, I think, to implementing a drug checking regime is the, administrative, the administration and the logistics of it. I mean, first of all, you need to, there's an investment of it in the technology, there's an investment of how, where you put it, and there are lots of logistics around that. If you're going to use a van, there are setup costs, there are staffing costs, there are the legal kind of areas to negotiate. You know, it's just a lot of stuff to organise, and, you know, 
in case you haven't, you know, we're not flush with cash at the moment to do these sorts of things. So, you know, I think it would take a concerted effort by a group of police and health working together over a course of 12 months to probably establish something, a small trial, and that you would need to run for a period of one to two years to get some any decent data that might inform an extension or, or broader rollout. But there are a lot of kind of practical hurdles and administrative kind of issues to resolve. So. Yeah, so at this stage, um, home reagent colorimetric testing is the best we have in terms of its ability to get out quickly, to get some sort of results. Um, we could do probably a better job at matching our forensic kind of data as a bit of an indication of what might be out there. But again, that lags behind depending on how many, you know, batches they have. You know, it can be up to six months, you know, for some of that stuff, maybe longer. You know, and generally it's used for criminal proceedings so that they can use it to determine you know, what that someone is actually up against a supply or possession charge. So by the time that test result comes out, those drugs have gone. They're through the system already. Unless someone is sitting on a deliberate batch of PMA because they want people to forget about it so that they then can sell it 12 months, 18 months, two years down the track when people have forgotten that that was a, a dangerous pill to look out for. So um, they're, they're the issues that we have with these sort of markets which make it difficult to, to kind of make a move on it. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot. So um, please fill out the uh, online uh, SurveyMonkey surveys for webinar guests, for real people in the room here. Uh, can you please fill out the paper survey? Uh, we're having a break now. So we'll be back in three weeks' time. We're having a break for school holiday people. It, the reason why we're doing this is because some presenters would come here during school holidays and lots of people are not here because some people can't make it. So uh, this semester we're going to have a break and we're coming back on the 13th of April with Dr. Kate Hall from Victoria, who's a senior lecturer at Deakin University, talking about emotional regulation and impulse control, her ERIC tool, um, which I, I highly recommend because it's a really fascinating tool to use with all these great small exercises you can use with clients who uh, have difficulties regulating their emotional states and distress, etc. So I really do invite you to come back to that. Thanks for spending an hour with me this morning and I wish you all a happy and safe Easter.